Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 514. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Jeff Walton. It's June 26, 2019. Yes, I have a special guest on. We're going to talk about the ACNA Plano Convention. Well, what do they actually call it? Assembly? Mm -hmm. what, that's what it's called. Yeah, uh, I, did, I did not get to go. George couldn't go. It was a busy, busy time for us. And so we do know who went, who is a reporter, and he's graciously accepted to talk to us about it. Before that, please like this episode, share the episode, comment on the episode. If you had not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, it's time to subscribe. And if you really want to get quick notices of when there's a new episode, click that little bell button that you see there. It's a little ringy thing. Maybe I'll put an icon right now. Maybe I won't. We'll see. It's Tuesday. No, it's Wednesday. What day is it? It is Wednesday. Oh, Jeff, I'm so far behind. Okay, so it is Wednesday. You are correct. So tell me, you went to Texas in June. How was that? Yeah, uh, shockingly cold. Um, <laughs> it was, um, uh, of course, warm outside, but uh -huh. the uh, Frisco, Texas uh, convention complex where ACNA Assembly was held was very chilly. <laughs> so I um, was kind of laughing uh, during one of the sessions. I was talking to one of my friends, and uh, he said that he couldn't hear the plenary speaker over the sound of the chattering of his own teeth. Uh, so it was very, very air conditioned. At one point, I went to a breakout session in a room, and uh, in that room, the temperature was 60 degrees. So uh, my my friend, uh, Chloe Ellen Miller, um, she offered me her um, teal fringed shawl to keep me warm, which I uh, declined, but appreciated the offer. Uh, but um, in general, though, even though uh, the climate control may have been quite cold, um, the uh, spirit there was quite warm. Uh, there was a lot of excitement about the release of the new finalized version of the 2019 ACNA Book of Common Prayer, mm -hmm. uh, which is beautiful. And I have my own copy now. And then in addition to that, um, the catechism has been finalized. There's been a, a working edition that's been in circulation for about uh, four years now, I think. And um, a authorized version is going to be released for 2020. Um, so there was some overview of that, explaining some of the refinements and changes that have taken place over the last four years. Um, and these are both things that ACNA has been promoting as tools uh, to develop discipleship. And that was the theme for this year's assembly. Did they not reelect another, if not the same, archbishop? Yes. Uh, in ACNA, uh, okay. each archbishop has a five-year term. Uh, and they can run uh, for two consecutive terms. Uh, so uh, Foley Beach's uh, initial five-year term was up, and he was re-elected by the ACNA College of Bishops just prior to assembly beginning. Um, and that seems to have gone very smoothly. Um, so he'll be uh, archbishop for another five years. He's archbishop. He's also in charge of GAFCON. He's got a lot on his plate. It's going to be interesting. Uh, when he was Archbishop the first round, he was completely booked and completely busy. I can't imagine adding any more to his schedule. I have an interview scheduled with him for Sunday afternoon. We'll see if it happens. Keep that in your prayers. Uh, but he's a busy guy. And oh, just... yeah. I mean, he's <laughs> everywhere. Um, so, I mean, I he has many different things that he's invited to. Sure. Um, I, I was frankly shocked and delighted that he was able to come to the Anglican Frontier Missions uh, 25th anniversary celebration in Richmond uh, this past March, which is really important for this organization that I'm a part of. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's in very high demand. Uh, so the fact that he was able to join us for that and preach was really fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's uh, scurrying around his own diocese, uh, unlike the Episcopal Church, where the presiding bishop um, <clears throat> just uh, exists on, on the general church level. Uh, in ACNA, the archbishop is also a diocesan bishop. So he has those responsibilities, he has provincial responsibilities, and as you noted, he is the chair of the GAFCON Primates Council, uh, which is a very big responsibility going forward. I'm just, I'm trying to tick off the headline, headlines in my mind of what happened. The, the big problem is there's nothing controversial. I mm -hmm. heard a rumor 
that at the closing and opening of the Eucharist, they didn't use the new uh, Eucharist from the prayer book. That's the only controversy I've heard of this whole thing. And I mean, that's headline news in a normal week, but there's other things going on internationally. So. Yeah, um, this was maybe uh, an assembly that was more noteworthy for what didn't happen than what did. Mm -hmm. uh, fairly smooth transition of re-election to the Archbishop. Um, the things that were voted on as constitutional changes uh, went forward without too much of a hitch. Um, and uh, it seemed to go pretty well. Um, an example of, uh, you mentioned the, the, the issue with the, uh, the prayer book. Uh, so that was touted, uh, and at the opening Eucharist, Archbishop Beach encouraged everyone to bring their new copies of the BCP uh, to have them blessed, which is a great idea. And they also pulled out the prayer book at several points during the assembly uh, for prayers. Uh, sort of transition time between sessions. Uh, so that was great to see it used. Uh, however, for a assembly that was largely focused on the prayer book, I, I thought it was pretty funny that both the opening Eucharist and the closing Eucharist uh, appeared to be using a version of Rite 2 uh, from the 79 prayer book rather than the, the ACNA Rite. Um, I, I guess that was orchestrated by Christchurch Plano, who sure. was the host congregation, and uh, they may have done so because um, for many people in ACNA, the, the, the ACNA right is relatively new, whereas everybody has some familiarity with right too. Uh, but I thought it was kind of amusing. Uh, there was also uh, a missing prayer of humble access, uh, which was not present at all. Uh, so uh, that caught my attention. Uh, but in general, um, you know, really smooth assembly. And uh, I'm not going to be uh, too, uh, too much of a stickler on, on this stuff. Uh, obviously, people were enthusiastic about the new prayer book, and going forward, I think it's going to be a helpful tool for discipleship. Um, well, one of the big things we noticed about GAFCON 10 years in, it, it's really matured. Uh, you know, they have a few things to change with the bylaws and uh, get themselves uh, documented into the provinces they represent. But other than that, GAFCON has matured. Now you look at the ACNA, they've matured as well. Uh, mm -hmm. They've survived. Nobody thought they would go five years. You know, they're at 10 years now. They're going to easily make 15 years. They announced that there are well over 1,000 churches, uh, which was an early desire to plant that many churches and get a good uh, spark set here in, on, on the ground in North America. It's nice to see these uh, desires met and promises kept and not to see infighting. And th that's usually what takes down organizations uh, is infighting within uh, dioceses and w within uh, provinces. Yeah, you know, this is something that many friends were very skeptical about 10 years ago. I was in uh, Texas in 2009 mm -hmm. when the new province was inaugurated. And I had many friends who were very supportive of ACNA who said, we are really on board with this project, but we're not convinced it's going to last. And the reason why is you have groups with very differing churchmanship, and they have basically been united by this boogeyman that at the time was Catherine Jefford Shorey. And once she is removed from the equation, they are just going to fly apart in all different directions. And uh, I think a lot of people, the first five years, were were very concerned about that. And those were legitimate concerns at the time. But um, Bob Duncan repeatedly emphasized, keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is creating disciples of Jesus Christ. Other things are sometimes important differences, but they are secondary and we can navigate our way through them. And obviously those haven't all been resolved. Um, obviously women's ordination continues to be a significant source of tension and that's not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, but the fact that the denomination has been able to hold, to hold together has been really good. And, and it continues to post modest growth as well. We got the new uh, 2018 numbers uh, and they show growth in both attendance and in membership. And of course, ACNA is planting new churches every year. Um, so last year, in 2018, uh, ACNA planted about one church every 10 days. Uh, this year, ACNA is on track to plant uh, a new church every seven days. So that's been a good sign. We also see a lot of people coming from different places into ACNA. 
Um, I think there was an expectation in the early years that ACNA and its sub-jurisdictions would go around vacuuming up disaffected Episcopalians. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly an important uh, thing to do, sort of the lifeboat uh, stage, so to speak. Uh, and that's really shifted. Um, in my own congregation, which was planted in September, which is a um, one of the newer church plants, um, I would say less than a third of the people have ever darkened the door of an Episcopal church. The vast majority have come from outside of our Anglican tradition, but have been drawn into it. And that's who we see is um, coming into ACNA today, are yeah. people who are unchurched, dechurched, or people who come from uh, evangelical traditions. In our church, I think the last Episcopalian was four or five years ago. We're getting the Methodists, the Lutherans, uh, disaffected United Church of Christ people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're filling up the pews. They're not. I mean, if you haven't left tech by now, you haven't left tech. And you know, good example mm -hmm. is Albany. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some new bishops. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a new bishop in Maine and a new bishop in Michigan. And they are heroes to the cause of checking the boxes of being politically collect, correct and social justice warriors. Yeah. And I, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the God now has a new gender. Uh, and it'd be kind of cool to talk about the new Bishop of Maine. Yeah. Um, so this last Saturday, uh, Thomas James Brown was consecrated as the um, new Bishop of Maine. Um, this is noteworthy for a few reasons. Uh, one is that he is uh, a partnered gay man uh, in a same-sex marriage, uh, and he is the first person uh, who identifies as gay, who's in a same-sex marriage, who has been placed in leadership of a diocese since Gene Robinson in 2003. So that's pretty significant. There have that's been a, a long lot, time. That's yeah, 15 there have been years. a lot of yeah. gay nominees for the Episcopate since then. Yeah but um, none that have been elected to a diocesan role uh, until Brown. Uh, Mary Glasspool was elected in 2009, uh, and she uh, is in a same-sex marriage, but she was elected as a suffragan, and she now serves as assisting bishop for the diocese in New York. So um, it, it wasn't the same as being a diocesan. And um, this is noteworthy. Uh, in addition to that, there have been other people who have been elected since. now. There was a Bishop of Toronto who was elected in the Anglican Church of Canada, who's also in a same-sex marriage, but that's uh, obviously outside of the Episcopal Church. And then um, the Episcopal Diocese of Michigan recently elected Bonnie Perry to replace Wendell Gibbs, who is retiring after almost 20 years. And uh, Perry is virtually a perennial candidate for the Episcopacy. She's been nominated uh, and run at least three different times. Uh, so she finally got elected to uh, be um, the Bishop of Michigan and uh, assuming she gets consents from the other diocese, uh, she'll be uh, consecrated, I believe, this autumn. Well, she did a great interview and I read this interview and she says she wants to be close to power. And <laughs> yeah. I'm reading further, fourth paragraph, and it sounds like a James Bond character. You know, I'm just like, there's a villain here coming out. This is so cool. So I think news in the Anglican community is going to certainly uh, foster itself well the next couple couple years. Yeah, and she basically said in order to make a difference, you have to be connected with the power structures. That's something I'm very interested in doing, end quote. And that's what she uh, said in an interview with the Detroit Free Press, sure. um, which I thought was kind of amusing because it, it, it really made it seem like she should be a lobbyist or someone in a public policy position. Um, but, but that uh, fulfills the desire of tech. Tech wants to be the religious UN. You yeah, know, I mean, it, she was definitely, what, what was the first thing she talked about in that yeah. article? Um, she doesn't spend a lot of time talking about evangelism. Uh, she, she talks about basically, uh, you know, unjust power structures and um, basically political engagement. And I, I think that's, that's how she understands her ministry. Uh, but uh, She's always been controversial, and she'll continue to be in her new position, assuming she gains the necessary consents. Uh, but going back to Brown, um, he is somebody who also checks other boxes. Um, I was looking through his resume, and uh, in addition to um, having a lot of experience in leadership in the Episcopal Diocese of Vermont and Massachusetts, and then the National Church as well, um, he also uh, served with Planned Parenthood. So from 1990 to 1994, 
Uh, Brown was director of education for Planned Parenthood of South Central Michigan, mm. uh, which of course is an affiliate of the largest abortion provider in the United States. That sets um, the that sets the bar very high. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, uh, the next bishop is going to have to actually be an abortionist now to to top that one. I think you would probably need to have that. Yeah. Um, so I mean, this just shows there's a lot of different boxes that are being checked. Uh, He's very connected to 815. He served as secretary on the um, uh, the, the, the uh, general convention committee for the nomination of a presiding bishop, which led to uh, Catherine Jefford Shorey becoming presiding bishop in 2006. Um, and he's been in a number of different uh, leadership roles in the, the national church. Um, so it's not surprising that he would end up becoming a diocesan bishop. Uh, but during his consecration service, which was this last Saturday in Portland, Maine, um, the most of the service was actually pretty normal. They opened up with uh, the hymn, The Church is One Foundation. There was a Charles Wesley hymn in there. Uh, they recited the Nicene Creed. So I was like, oh, this isn't so bad. But uh, <laughs> then when we got to the Nicene Creed, in the service bulletin, it is printed normally. But in the version that Brown led the congregation in reciting, he identifies the Holy Spirit as a she. Uh, so he basically has decided to unilaterally transition the Holy Spirit uh, to be a, uh, a she. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, the Nicene Creed uh, hasn't been significantly altered unless you count the filioque clause. It hasn't been significantly altered since the Council of Constantinople in 381. Yeah. So the fact that uh, the Episcopal Bishop of Maine has decided to unilaterally take his editing pen to it, uh, I thought said something. And um, that's that's pretty significant when you decide to go in and alter the creed. Uh, that language was um, very carefully uh, introduced at Nicaea and then perfected uh, between then and, and Constantinople a few years later. So... Um, the idea that he would just go in and, and change it to make what is effectively a, a statement to the current cultural moment that the United States is in, I think, says something. Well, it's it's news and further news and future news for us. Jeff, I want to thank you for your time. I'm running up on an appointment I got to go take, uh, so we can't sit and talk too much longer. Uh, what's your next event you're going to? Yeah. Um, I'm on an ACNA Executive Council, so I'll be headed down to Greensboro for that in August. Mm -hmm. And then um, the thing I'm really excited about in September is new wineskins for Global Mission. Um, okay. Some of your viewers might remember this as uh, the Episcopal Church Missionary Community for many years. And uh, it meets every three years. It brings, it is unique in that it brings together people from ACNA, overseas Anglican jurisdictions, and the Episcopal Church together in one place. So you have a lot of mission-minded folks that come together who are all working on the same page to spread the gospel. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that in September, and that'll be in Asheville, North Carolina. And all my travels, New Wineskins is one of my favorites. Uh, definitely, I'll be there as well. We'll be videotaping for Anglin TV and uh, uh, posting live feed, if Asheville, North Carolina has good internet, and they do, <laughs> on Facebook for uh, New Wineskins. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Jeff Walton. And you've been watching Anglican Unscripted, episode 514.